Oh, I should have got a nicer shirt. This is my gardening shirt. Anyway, um, so I, I've been having a lot of fun over the past two years working on different, well, learning about assembly language and implementing some stuff. And I did a lot of work over the past year and a half, two years. And let me just show my screen. I, I worked on this, I call it Schizo, which is Scientific Computing Homemade Implementation Zone. Basically, it was a bunch of libraries and examples that went from the bare bones, like the, like the basic stuff, like file IO and printing and vector algebra, all the way up to like, you know, vector graphics and advanced engineering stuff. But the problem was, you know, what you what you don't realize is, you know, six months of learning something, and then a year and a half of implementing, you know, what you what you know you realize that at six months, you thought you knew a lot more than you actually did, you know, Dunning-Kruger. And I wish now that I had done things differently. And so I thought, you know what, why don't I go back and kind of redo things a bit differently, a bit better in some cases than what I had before, also a bit worse in some cases. And just to make things, you know, a little bit different, fix things along the way, and then take the YouTube channel along with me as I go. And that's what this series is. And this is episode one. We're going to talk about a minimal executable, but... This will be at least you know 30 or 40 episodes long before we get to like the the end of kind of things that i'm you know willing to cover so yeah that'll be pretty cool and um basically what we're going to be doing in a nutshell is everything entirely from scratch so like it says no dependencies or even standard libraries we're not going to use you know printing print f we're not going to use any of that stuff from standard libs Every instruction you can see here from scratch, every instruction that we're writing, that the program is executing, we are writing with some very, very few exceptions, those being syscalls. And if you don't know what a syscall is, don't worry, neither do I, but we're going to be using a couple of syscalls um, to do certain things like um, reading files, writing files, changing file permissions, creating files. And also, I think we have one to leave. Like sysexit is to leave the um, leave the executable. So I think we're using just five um, syscalls to to do everything we have to do. Just the bare bones stuff. Every other instruction, every other machine instruction, we are writing ourselves. Well, we're going to use ourselves from scratch and construct more advanced algorithms from those instructions, right? And also, not only that, but we're also going to be using a very minimal executable format. You know, on Linux, by the way, this is all for Linux and BSD. Um, everything is an ELF. All executables are ELF formats, right? So we're gonna kind of be using the bare bones ELF file, not the one that's full of garbage that, you know, the C compilers and the Rust compilers and stuff kind of create for you. And they create those things because they want your program to be able to be debugged. They want it to be able to, you know, be used with other, you know, utilities and stuff like that, which is, you know, fine, but, for me and you know someone who has a very small brain like me, we need simplicity. We we don't need all this extra layers of complexity. You know, so with that, I'll get into one disclaimer, which I think is kind of important. It's that I have no idea what I'm talking about. Everything I say is is likely incorrect. You know, when you go to a college class, you know, the professor and the TAs, they know everything and the textbook knows everything and they teach you everything and they throw information at you, which is great. You get all the information you could ever want. That's awesome if you can absorb it. You know, I didn't go to school for this. I went to school for a different field entirely. But, you know, I, I know, and you probably can, would agree with me if, if you've been in this situation that you don't remember that stuff more than a, a year or two years. If you, you get a job and you don't use it, you lose it, right? So a lot of things that I learned in college that I don't use. I mean, it was in, obviously it was in short-term memory and I, I don't know it anymore. So, I mean, I'm probably familiar with it and I could probably figure it out, you know, work through it, but it's not, you know, in my brain and that's kind of the advantage of you know doing things kind of from you know what i'm doing here which is going in a very practical way and just diving headfirst into something and learning it yourself piecing together you know what works what doesn't work seeing what gives you an error what doesn't give you an error seeing you know what kind of exceptions you get seeing looking through the manual looking through forum posts looking at other executables looking um Stack Overflow, there's a couple guys on there that are awesome. Two or three guys are fantastic. You can read their posts and learn so much from those guys. Um, and just that process, you know, you, it's it's very different. It's not like you have a bunch of information. It's like you have a line of information with 
with a very clear trajectory. I needed this one to do this one, and this one to do this one, and this one to do this one. Everything had like a clear reason. And it's like that why and the how that makes you remember it forever. I will never forget what I've learned over the past two years, I don't think, because everything has a purpose and a reason and I had to go through and figure that out each one on its own. You know, you don't get that kind of a network, you know, in your brain when you just get information thrown at you, you know, on a on a whiteboard in your college classroom or, or whatever it is. So yeah. For that reason, you know, like, like it says, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but that that's a blessing and a curse, you know. Not having that, you know, official background in, in a collegiate, you know, experience means that I had to figure this out on my own, which again can be bad, but it also has its advantages. I can kind of bring people I give you a second opinion, basically, about what, what I understand versus what the professor would say is, is the truth. Okay. With that out of the way, I don't want to waste any more time. It's six minutes in G's already. Wow, that was long. I wanted to make a minimal executable. And you see here, I got a boomer and I got a zoomer. And these people's ideas of minimal executable are just wrong. The zoomer is even more wrong, but the boomer is wrong too. The a boomer would say, oh, minimal executable would have to return zero or return a number 42, right? Very cringe. That, you know, that's, that's fine, but it's not minimal. Maybe it's minimal in, in C or something. But it's not minimal in assembly. Maybe it's minimal in MATLAB. It's not minimal in, in assembly. In my opinion, in my opinion, a zoomer would say, "Oh yeah, print hello world, yeah, console log hello." No, this guy's this guy's dumb. Millennials, as usual, we have to clean up the place. So they're right. Infinite loop, true. And if you can figure out what instruction right here, right now, without fast forwarding or, or cheating, what instruction we're going to use for an infinite loop, a minimal infinite loop, you could be my friend. So that's awesome. So we're going to be doing this. Now, the first thing I want to talk about, because it's kind of important, is what what's the tool chain? How do smart people, not like me, but how do like, smart people create executables? Well, what they do is they take their C code, their assembly code, their C++ code. They take, if they're maybe having some kind of a, a mental problem, their, their Rust code, right, their Go code, they run it through a compiler, and they get these object files. And then maybe take some pre-compiled system libraries, maybe like the printf, maybe like the you know math libraries, and they'll link them together with the linker, and they'll get an executable binary, which is a kind of elf file. We'll talk about elf files in a minute. And it's great. This this process works and it's for geniuses. It's for PhDs, it's for you know Mensa scholars, IQ 197 minimum to do this. Now, simpletons like me, we can't comprehend this. Clippy is right. He says the smaller the brain, the smaller the tool chain. Very true, Clippy. Why the words wise words of wisdom from Clippy as usual. We're just gonna take the assembly code, run it through the assembler, and get a binary out of it, and then we're gonna make that binary executable and run it. There's there's no fancy linking, nothing like that. We're gonna we're not gonna have any standard libraries that the NSA is gonna to use to, to watch us. No, no linker, no libraries, no dependencies, no other languages. One one tool chain iteration, basically, the assembler. And by the way, you don't even need that if you really want it to be based. You would just write things in zeros and ones. But me, I don't speak zero and one, I speak English, so we're gonna use the assembler to translate from English mnemonics to zeros and ones. Now, I can already sense like the 20% of the of the audience who are really like boomers, either IRL or in disguise, saying, oh, you must use the linker, you must use the linker, all this stuff. You need the linker to make your binary executable. Without it, the OS won't know how to load your binary into memory and run it. Yeah, 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 yeah. True, the brainlets are right, but we don't need to use the linker to do this. This is what the linker does. We don't need it. If we write just everything ourselves, including what the OS needs to know about our zeros and ones in order to run it, we don't have to use the linker, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. And so to the boomers, I always, I always respond in the wise words of Obama, he always said no you. So with that out of the way, I want to talk about um, the the elf header, what elf files are and stuff like that, just briefly in on Wikipedia. And then we'll fill out a little table here where we're going to juxtapose compiled C, or well, a minimal executable, like an infinite while loop in C in a linked assembly, which is like, you know, boomer assembly. And then we have our direct assembly um, 
binary as well. And we'll juxtapose how, how big those files are, how complex the headers are and all that. So I think it's pretty interesting. We'll take a look. So the first thing I want to show you was at the elf header. So on, on Linux and on BSD, this elf header is basically what tells the, let me open up this picture. It, it, it's what tells the zeros and ones in your file. It's what tells the OS what those numbers mean. So the first couple of zeros and ones, 64 bytes on our 64-bit um, uh, OS, 64 bytes are the elf header. And that just says, hey, the file that you're looking at is an elf file, which means it's either executable file or a library file or whatever. And also, here's here's how that you, how you should open it, right? And then the program header basically says, okay, well, these sections of memory in the binary are you know this big in the binary, but they're actually meant to be this big in the in, when you put it into memory. And here's where you here's what the permissions are. Here's how to execute that. All this stuff, and those two things are all you need. You only need one elf header because we have one file, and you only need one program header because you're only loading, you know, ideally, you know, one chunk of code into memory. Of course, you know, the boomers they get their grammy hands on stuff and they make things overly complex. They add layers and layers of paint. It's like it's like you have this piece of wood. I got a prop, it's a piece of wood, and like you apply layers of stain and paint, 10, 20, 30 of them until you no longer can see the the grain of the wood, and it's like, it's nuts. It, I can understand why they do that. They do it because they want their their code to be hold on. They want their code to be you know when they execute it, they want to be able to pull it into other utilities to put it in a debugger and stuff. But the the, the issue is that uh, it's just overly complex for someone like me, and it just you'll see how bloated the the file is. Which again, it's not not a huge problem. We have you know ten terabyte hard drives out there you can get, but you know it's still it's not uh, not ideal. Everything else you see here, dot text, these are just sections. So basically the boomers, they put their instructions in the text section of, a, of a assembly file. They put their read only data in, I think that's what it stands for, the RO data section. And then they have their regular, you know, volatile memory or whatever, the memory that they're gonna change things in data. And that's how they do it. And they have a section table, which kind of defines where those sections are, what they're called. And that's like for debugging and stuff. Again. It's not, I mean, it's useful, but not to us, <laughs> okay? Um, and that's what the header, the header is. Um, and just to go into some details here, like the first four bytes, so address is zero in, in the binary, that the zeros and ones, the first four bytes are basically this number followed by ELF. Just to tell the operating system, hey, this, this file, it's an ELF file. And then you have a bunch of stuff. You put like two for 64 bit. You'll put, you know, all this stuff for NDNIS. You'll define your ABI. Again, it doesn't seem to matter actually. Um, you can put system five, you can put FreeBSD, you can put Linux. It, I think it all seems to work. I don't know if that's supposed to be a feature or a bug, but anyway, um, yeah, we're gonna fill all this garbage. I'll get to that in a minute. That's the section header. Then you have the program header, which is again, how to load this into memory, what it is, you know, and all that. So again, you have 64 bytes of section, or sorry, uh, elf header, and then you need at least 56 bytes of program header. So you have one program header, and then your program can start. So that's 120 bytes of just boilerplate at the top of your program that you need minimum, and then you can start your program. Okay, that, that's kind of what my chimpanzee brain understands from this. You need 64 bytes of elf header, followed by 56 bytes of program header, and then your program can start. That's the that's the minimal ELF file. So with that out of the way, I wanted to um, populate this table showing you a couple of these different examples in C assembly and then direct assembly. And um, yeah, this is gonna be a while loop. So let me pull up my, um, my computer. So this is a, just a, a I made a quick, a virtual machine for FreeBSD. I wrote the whole code on FreeBSD, but um, I just want to show you on a clean install, you know, how this works. So we only have a couple things. Uh, hold on. We have we have NASM. That's going to be our assembler. We're going to use I think it's called Intel syntax. Um, and then we also have a C compiler, which version I think I guess we're using Clang. Um, doesn't matter. Just just to juxtapose stuff. Long term, we're not going to use C compiler. We're only going to use um, NASM for everything. 
But just for our first episode here, we're going to talk about the C compiler, just to juxtapose the two. So this is my my uh, program, my uh, my my suppository, my Soy Hub suppository, and I'll put it up for you guys in the description. You guys can take a look. But um, oh, we need a license here. Let me put a license. All right, that should be good. So if I go into my examples folder, I have an example one, minimal executable. And um, in here I have a couple examples. I have the, the C version, I have the first boomer version of assembly, and then I have our minimal executable. So let's go to the C1 first. Um, in here I have two files. I have a main function. Obviously you need a, this is my code.c file. I have a, this is just the, you know, int main while one, this loops forever. It has return zero, but it never will because it will loop forever, obviously. And then we have our shell script. I don't use make files. Make files are from the devil. I call them snake files. So yeah, we use just this. So first thing we're gonna do is cc code.c binary. We're just gonna make the binary with a C compiler and then run it. So that's simple enough. Um, if we run this, you can see it hangs. This binary is running, it loops forever, while one, success. <laughs> minimal executable done. However, it's not so minimal. Check out this. If you look at the file size, I'll write this down. It's 14,672 bytes, right? Word count binary, yeah, 14,672 bytes. It's immense. I said before, we only need 120 bytes of, of boilerplate. And then the loop, by the way, that's a two byte instruction. So you only need 122 bytes minimum, yet the C compiler made 14,000 byte executable. And yeah, you could optimize for size, but don't worry, it's not gonna get anywhere close. It's, it's really gonna help at all. So that's one thing. And now there's actually a function called, um, you know, read elf. You basically can check what the elf file has to say. And so if you look at this, you see at the top, you know, you have the you know the elf header, right? It's breaking it down for us what's inside there. And two things I want to point out is the number of program headers, and you only need to have one. It has eleven. I'll write that down. And then it has thirty-seven section headers. You need zero. Why does it have so much? It has so much because it's all it's all full of garbage. I mean, here let me show you. All this stuff, it's all garbage. This is all parts of the boilerplate for our while loop. Why? This is the C runtime at its worst. So yeah, it's all garbage and that's enough of that. So if we go back to our second example, um, this is the boomer assembly example. So in here I have two files. I have code.asm and I have run.sh. So this is, this is what boomers do for assembly. This is like the bare minimum assembly file for a boomer. Um, you have a global start that basically means I have a, a label in my, there's, there's an address that I'm calling underscore start, it's right here. That address, I wanna expose that to the rest of my program when it's linked later on. And yeah, that's what that line is, global start. It's a globally identifiable label. Then, as I said before, section text, that's where the boomers put their instructions. So that's what we're gonna do. Then they have their, their entry point label and then they have, this is the minimum thing to do. It would just be jump start. That's the minimum uh, while loop. Basically you jump back to this label over and over and over and over again, right? Here's the entry point, start. First instruction is jump to start. So you jump back. This is as easy as it gets. Actually, let me show you, um, I have it open actually. This is the jump instruction. This is the opcode. So, EB means jump short. So basically that opcode, if you look at the zeros and ones, the hexadecimal EB, that means jump to within a very short range of where I currently am. And then the next thing after that is kind of how far. And because this is a two byte instruction, EB distance, each, each one is one byte, that would mean that you're just gonna constantly be jumping back two bytes. So and if you know, if, if for eight bits, negative two is just FE, right? Yeah, so your, your command is gonna be, your code is gonna be EBFE, and that's gonna be your entire code. That, that's your entire binary that's actually running is just one opcode of two bytes, 
and the value of that instruction is ebfe. So with that out of the way, let me get back to this. Make sure you can see what you can. Um, that's what the assembly language looks like for boomers. And then you have the, sh the shell script that compiles it and runs it. So we're using NASM, making it an ELF64 type format. Then we're linking it with a linker. Again, why we're we doing this? I don't know, because Boomer said so. And then we're running it. And if you want to, you can strip some symbols from this to make it a little bit smaller, but really it doesn't help that much at all like before. So we'll, we'll, we'll execute this and I'll show you how, it's, how it works. So you see, it again, it loops, it's, it's successful, it's hanging, right? There's no error coming up, it's, it is looping forever. Um, and if you look at the file size of this binary, it's 880. So it's way less, so here, 880. File size is way, way, way smaller than what it was before. It was 14,000, now it's 880. If you look at the read elf, you'll see this time there's four program headers and six section headers. So definitely an improvement. It was a lot more before, but it's not not anywhere near where it needs to be, right? This, this number should be zero, and this number should be one. And if you go through, you can see that all this crap is still here. Not as much, but there's still a bunch of crap in this file. And by the way, if you were to strip it with that strip command, some of this would go away, but not all of it. So anyway, that's that. And actually, at this point, I'm going to actually dump the binary for you. So if you hex dump the binary, we can get rid of this, I think. Oh, no, we can't. Hold on. That's... So here you can see the actual, um, this is the actual binary in memory that we're, uh, we just, just created with that NASM and the linker. And you can see at the top, here's that magic number. And by the way, the ending in this is such that things are switched around sometimes. So don't worry about that. But here is that ELF header, the first 64 bytes. So from zero, zero, all the way to the 40. So these four lines, that's the ELF header. And then everything else is program headers, section headers, and actual binary. And here, FEB, this, remember I said it was EBFE, that was the jump instruction. Here it is, EBFE. So that's the only instruction in this, in this program. Everything else is just garbage. Everything else is useless garbage. This whole thing is a waste of space, except for that one instruction. Of course, you do need some of it to run the file, to tell the OS how to load it into memory, but you don't need all of it. You only need that single two byte instruction to actually run. So that, that out of the way, I'm gonna go to our last um, example here, the sort of bare bones elf file here. Let's open it up. So I've got two, two files. Again, um, code.asm is the assembly file, and then we have run the sh. Let me show you the sh one first, show you how simple this actually is. In this case, we're not using the linker. Well, what we're gonna be using is just NASM. So we're gonna use NASM and make a binary with NASM. So dash F bin, that makes a format binary, called binary from code.asm. That's what that string of commands means. And all we have to do is because of Linux and BSD being kind of cringe, is you have to make it executable before you can run it. So chmod plus x means make this binary executable. So that's what that, that does. Then it runs it. So really, we have one, one tool chain step, and then we have one Linux BSD compatibility step, ultimately. So if I go back to the assembly uh, file, I can go through this. But let me just show you what's going on. I have a elf header. So you can see here a lot of that crap about you know what the program is. Here, look at this entry point. I call it start. I'll show you that in a second. Everything here, these these um these are all like NASM syntactical things. So DB means define byte. So here we're defining four bytes. The first one is 7F, the next one is E, then L and F. Then this one, you know, is two. D times means do this here in this case seven times. DW means define two bytes, DD means four bytes, DQ means eight bytes, right? All that. That's all this here. This this is the elf header, that's 64 bytes total. This is the program header, that's only one of them. 56 bytes, um, and you can see we're doing kind of some some algebra here to compute things that are of interest. And then I'm, I have everything explained on the side about what each line is. You can peruse this at your leisure. Um, and then here is the actual code. And here's how I will format every single assembly file from here on out. Well, every single ex every single like example. We're gonna write assembly files that are functions in later videos. But this is like 
the actual executable itself that calls the function, that executable needs to have this, this format in, in my monkey brain. First thing I put in here is includes. Here's where we include literally what the the, the um, macro for NASM is you know, percent include, and you can include a file. So you include you know, func1.asm, and it will include that function. It will literally paste the function here. It will go to that file, copy it, and paste it here. That's what it's going to do. And so we're going to put all our includes in this chunk. So all the things that we could possibly need to call are going to come before, and it doesn't have to be before, it could be after, but before we're actually going to start the program. So start is our start address, and end is the bottom of the um, the end of the instructions, I'll say. We, we will eventually put stuff below end, like we'll put our dynamic memory, we'll put our like heap and stuff at the bottom, and I'll tell you about that in a later video. But for the time being, this is our entire program. We have one start address, like before, like the boomers had, and our only instruction is jump to start. And if I go back to the top, remember I have a start and end that surrounds the instructions. So I'll go back to the top and I'll explain some of the other stuff that we had. So load address, this number can be anything. I think it has to be more than zero, but it seemed to work for me if you put any number in. This basically means when the OS loads your code into memory, your binary into memory, what address will it start at? So here I have org. Maybe that means origin or something. It just means that everything after this will be with respect to address 20,000 hex, this number here. So put whatever you want, you can put in like 10 or whatever. I think you should make it a multiple of like a thousand hex or something, but whatever number you want to put in, you put in, it's fine. Then I'm defining another variable. So percent define defines, it's a macro that defines a local variable. It's not, it's not a register, it's not a value. It's just for the assembler. It, it has no, it's not going to be in your code. It's not going to, it's not going to be, well, I guess it could be, but it, it's not going to end up, this number, it's not going to be, 0x05312ae. It's just uh, for the assembler as it goes through to use this and put it in location. So in this case, it uses load address as the origin. This bits com this bits instruction, basically the problem, uh, let me go here. The problem with NASM is that when you do a binary, it assumes 16 bits for whatever reason, I think. And so if you say bit 64, that means everything after this, assume it's 64 bit. So that's what that means. And then if I go through here, you can see one of the entries in the ELF header was the entry point for our program. And there I just put start. So this basically will plug in the address of start, which will be like 20,120, I guess. And it will put that number smack dab here, right? Simple as everything else is hard coded. That's not gonna change, right? Hard coded stuff. And by the way, I said it, it. This is not. This could change, right? It can change if we were to add. What if you were to add a hundred bytes of of uh, functions here? Then it, it would no longer be. This would no longer be address one twenty. It would be address two twenty, and actually it would be address two twenty thousand two twenty because it's all with respect to that load address. And so yeah, here's the the address of that start location, and you can see again here it's. Um, that location. So this is just the offset to this this point in memory. Actually, no, sorry. This address will always point to the includes. So uh, both our headers combined will be 0x78. I, I'm pretty sure that means 120. Let me check actually before I sound like an idiot. 120 in hex, 78. Yep. So yeah, that's, oh geez, what did I do? What did I do? Oh no. Yeah, um, so this basically means at address 20,120 will be our virtual memory start location. Again, this is not important. This is just gonna be stagnant. Then these two things are actually important. Code size means this is how big our program, th this program header is referring to a chunk of code Code size, remember that was the distance from start, actually it was the distance from like here to end. And so, yeah, that will refer to that quantity. 
and then this one refers to how big that should actually be when we put it in memory. And in this case, it's the same size. But if we were to add like a heap and we were to add like some other stuff, we're gonna have to add to this. We're gonna have to say like, you know, heap size plus, you know, buffer size, you know, other stuff, right? So we may have to add to this one later on to support the like dynamically allocated memory or memory that we don't wanna have in the binary. We don't wanna have it on our hard disk but we'd actually do want to have more memory to use for variables as we go. Hope that makes sense. It probably doesn't. If it doesn't, let me know. And that's that. So we can take this and we can run this. Oh no, what did I do? Hold on. If I run this, again, it hangs indefinitely, but the cool thing about this is that the file size is, you can see here, the expected value of 122, right? That's 64 bytes header of elf header, 56 bytes of program header, two bytes of executable, of actual, you know, um, instructions. And so I can actually dump it for you first, hex dump the binary. Don't, need, don't even need less anymore because it's so short. Look at this. So the first, everything from 00, zero to the end of 30 of this line, those 64 bytes are the elf header then from 40 all the way to here, I guess that would be 78, that is your program header. And then you know, the prophetic feeb. this is our eternal jump instruction. And you know, if you wanted to be a troll, you wanted to open up someone's binary and change one of the instructions to feeb, you would cause their program to break. If it ever got to that line, it would just loop forever indefinitely. So if you want to be a troll, you can do that. But yeah, this is this is it. This is basically the minimal executable that we're talking about. And again, we're going to add more to this. We're going to add more instructions, more complicated programs, obviously, than just a while loop. But the overall framework is there to handle all this. If I go back to the code, oh, what did I do? Oh, that's just the binary. Oh, my God. these things will update, right? If I add more code, this will update. If I add, if I want to add a heap, I have to define some stuff, but I can add a heap. If I want to, I'll get into that in all in later videos, but that will all be, you know, easy to handle. Now, if I go to read elf, you'll see that in this case, we have only one program header and we have zero section headers. Again, that's the minimum that you need for your program to run. Alrighty, so with that out of the way, let me go back to our little table here and let me draw these numbers in. So, so the binary for the C1 was 14672. The binary for the Boomer assembly version was 880. And you could get these numbers a little bit smaller by using the optimization flags and by stripping them, but you won't get anywhere close to what this one was, which was 122. That, that's the minimum number of bytes you need. It is literally a minimal executable fact. Actually, it's not a fact because um, I'll put a link in the description. There's a guy, he has like, it's called like a whirlwind tutorial and something in like elf binaries or whatever. It's, he actually kind of folds the headers together and he kind of embeds the program inside itself. That's cheating, but it is, it is less file size, but again, it's not extensible, so. You can see here, we are 120 times better than C was just for a simple while loop. And of course, as you add more code, this boilerplate becomes less and less important. But no, this is still there. You still have 14 kilobytes of garbage in your code. Now, you don't, it's not just garbage. It's not that it's garbage, it's that you don't understand it. You have to have like 30 years industry experience you know, in, in this particular stuff to know what all that stuff means. I, I will never get there. I will die long before I'm at the you know place where I can understand what the what everything in the C you know in in, in the elf header for the C compiled binary actually is used for. So never gonna happen. Section headers. The first one was 37. The next one was six. But of course, you don't need any. You don't need any of them. And lastly, we had program headers. There were 11 program headers in the C version. I think I wrote down there were four in the Boomer version, and then there were just the minimum of one in our version. So you can see at the end of the day, 
we win. Hold on, where's my box? We win. Everyone else is losers. We are winners. It's not really that not every day that, that the monkey brain wins, but today we win. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to share. Um, we have a minimum executable that we can add stuff to. In the future videos, we're going to talk about um, registers and the stack, calling convention, system five ABI. What I like about that, what I don't like about that, after having used it for you know many, 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 many programs, things that I think I could probably do differently, not better, but just ways that I want to think about things differently. Um, we're talking about some syscalls, we'll talk about file IO, we'll talk about printing stuff to the screen. Again, all of this is going to be done manually by us. We're not going to use any libraries, nothing like that. With that done, I'm losing my voice right now. Thanks for watching. This was a long video just for this little topic. I'm surprised how long it was, but we covered a lot. And if you stuck in to the end of this, I'm really thankful. Again, these videos aren't monetized. I never will monetize that. It's really cringe. I don't care about likes or subs or views. What I do care about is like people who leave nice comments. It's like, <laughs> you know, I don't have very many people that message me on my phone. So when I get a vibration, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm popular. And, uh, when I see someone that says, oh, wow, thanks for the video. Much love from Argentina. You know, it makes me happy. So if you want to make me happy, leave a comment. Otherwise, I couldn't collect what you do. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>